All right. So the speaker for the evening, uh, Kim, Kim, Kimberly Simmon of KMS Native Plants. So she's going to be talking about an introductory guide to starting a pollinator garden. There are several designs that Kimberly has done that we have on our website. Like we have put two out in the public. We are actually trying to do some of the creative work behind to uh, clean up the others. And over the time, we will be putting more garden designs from Kimberly um, and others on our website. Um, but what inspires Kimberly is the fact that she's been a grower for a very, very long time. She's very knowledgeable and has a fantastic and inspiring story of how she, you know, right during the pandemic, she started up a business. And it's so uh, heartening to think that it was a native plant business and she's happy to report that it is doing very well, right? So um, somebody who's very knowledgeable, enthusiastic and is fostering this community by actually uh, putting up, you know, al almost year round garden center that many of us native plant aficionados can go to and uh, get plants when we need to. So with that, let me turn over and um, I will actually present uh, from my screen, uh, Kimberly will do the talking uh, and we hope that this will go well. Let me just do that. Uh, Kimberly, you can see, can you see your presentation? I can see it. Okay, perfect. So uh, go ahead, Kimberly, it's yours. Okay. Um, hi, <laughs> everybody. Um, this is creating a pollinator garden in your yard. No experience necessary. Um, actually, we can go right to the next slide there, Raj. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I've been in the business for just about 20 years. I started as a pickup yard assistant for HR Talmadge, which was out in Riverhead, um, where I learned just about almost everything I need to know about growing plants, um, ID, everything like that from, I learned from Alan Talmadge. Um, and while I was there, I got the pleasure to work with Pete Oldoff and I helped grow all the, well, a lot of the perennials for the battery um, conservancy, um, which was just an, an amazing experience. Um, I went to school for horticulture. I'm six credits short because they stopped the program. So I have to get myself over to Farmingdale. Um, I worked for Glover Perennials for a little while. Um, I had my own garden maintenance company for probably about 12 to 15 years, um, where I did everything from mulching, weeding, planting, container gardens, and you name it, I did it. Um, I've also been a floral designer, which I currently still am, but my last day there is the 31st. Um, I'm working with a grower, Scott Clark, who is out east in Kachog, and he's growing, um, I'm doing a, uh, a one quart program with him. So most of my one quart plants that you will be buying from me this year came from him and he's growing them especially for me. Um, that's my little story. <laughs> and we can go to the next slide. Okay, so the big question is, what is a pollinator garden? Um, I'm not going to bore you with all of the just um, definitions and everything. So this is just a quick, a quick thing here. So a pollinator garden is a garden planted for the pollinators in your area. For us being, it would be Long Island and the Northeast. Um, what is a pollinator? A pollinator is anything which helps distribute pollen from the stamen of a male plant to the pistil of a female plant. It can be bees, wasps, beetles, birds, and even the wind, and in some places, bats. Um, we will focus on mostly native plants right now um, that provide nectar and pollen for a range of native pollinating insects um, for this area, like I said. So we can go to the next slide. Like I said, I'm not going to bore you with definitions and things like that. So we can go to the next one. Okay. Now, creating the pollinator garden. What you want to do is you want to um, take inventory of your yard. Um, do you use all of it? Probably not. You'll be surprised at how little room you really need to do this. Um, so the unused portions of your lawn are perfect places to add habitat for our bees, butterflies, and preferably a very sunny spot. Um, like I said, as you can see here, um, the manicured lifeless yards that make up most of our neighborhoods have so much potential. 
I mean, looking how many people just see this even in their own yard, just a fence line with just a lawn going up to it. Um, you can mix, you can be simple. You can mix asters with solidago. You can just do a small bed of just um, uh, purple coneflowers. You can, I, I have a picture here of Panicum virgatum, which is switchgrass. Um, and that's its fantastic fall color. And when the sun hits that, it's absolutely amazing. But I mean, you don't need to go large scale. You can keep it small. I have a picture here of the High Line, which I haven't gotten to see yet. And I really want to get in there. But half of the plants on the High Line are native plants. And what they're doing there is they're using plants that work with the community they have. So they it basically, it's very dry up there. And so what they do is they're working a lot with plants that like dry conditions, because that's, you have to know what you're working with. Um, whether you have moist soil, average soil, dry soil, um, it makes a big difference in your plant selection. So we'll be talking more about plants that take um, a more dry to an average soil. Um, but if we want to talk more, we can do that another time. That's a whole nother, a whole nother presentation. Um, okay, we can switch. Okay, you want to start small. Don't go out, don't look at your yard and go, I have all the space. I want to do something here. I want to do something there. I need to do it here. You're going to drive yourself crazy. <laughs> so right off the bat, lower your expectations um, and focus on small groups. Because like I said, if you, if you start looking at everything, you're going to overwhelm yourself and think it's never, ever going to be done. Um, like I, said, I can't stress this enough. Um, start small. Be realistic with your, with your goals and remember that a garden is never done, it's always changing. So once you think you have it done, if you're like me, you're gonna go back in and tear it apart and do something else. Um, so like I said, it's always changing and it takes three years for a perennial to actually fully mature. So the first year it's gonna be, you know, it's like I said, don't expect lush, gorgeous, Fan, unless you're using, you know, three gallon plants, but most people are not doing that. Um, I base everything on, I use a lot of quarts and one gallon pots. Um, like I said, so in three years, no matter which one you do, like if you did a quart, you did a gallon, you did a two gallon, that one quart plant is going to be just as equal to that one gallon plant within those three years. Um, it's, let's see. Um, <laughs> Um, so keep, and also keep in mind the plant's mature size. Um, for example, say you want to put in asters. Um, I'll use Radon's favorite, which is an aromatic aster as an example. Um, its mature size can be anywhere between 24 to 36 inches wide as it gets to its three years. So you want to keep that in mind. So I usually say when you're planting, do at least a 12 inch spacing. This way it fills in pretty quick, but it doesn't fill up so fast where you have to all of a sudden divide it already by that third year. Um, I know a lot of people like to plant everything right together because they want that instant gratification, but try and keep yourself away from it. Um, there also, you have to remember, there's, um, there's no such thing as a no maintenance garden. Um, you, when it comes to native plants, though, we can actually depend on Mother Nature to do her job. Um, this will be what they wind up being as a low maintenance garden because what they do is they take care of themselves. I mean, a lot of people, like I said, this is the biggest thing with native plants. Everybody, everybody says, they're going to look like a mess. They're going to look like a mess, but they don't. As long as you lay everything out correctly, you take care of it, it'll be fine. Um, I'm actually just getting used to the fact of letting something finally, you know, go dormant and then leaving, leaving its foliage there or its stems. That used to drive me crazy, but I'm starting to learn that, you know what, if you let it do that, it creates its own mulch. So right there, you're suppressing weeds. Um, it brings in all of the insects that you're looking to provide for, and there's like I said, there's going to be maintenance because there's always going to be weeds. Even though we don't like using that word, there's always going to be weeds. So there will be a little bit, like I said, the first few years you're going to have to do it. Um, but like I said, once once everything takes its own place, it'll be fine. Um, 
my biggest thing also, I don't know about anybody else, but when I walk around the neighborhood, I see how landscapers come in and they plant everything. So I have a little graphic here just so people know um, exactly how to plant a plant, which a lot of people don't. And that's what we want to also do. If you look at the picture that's there, I think it's a strawberry, actually, the picture that's there, um, where it says just right, that is where the top of the plant meets the root zone. So you want to make sure that's level with the soil. If it's too high or too deep, you're going to, um, what'll happen is you may have crown rot because it'll be down too far, or it just won't take because it's not planted correctly. So it's going to, you'll bring in diseases that way. Um, but like I said, most important is to make sure you're planting it correctly. Um, when you get a one quart plant or a gallon plant, you'll see there's a soil line. Usually that soil line is at the just right zone, but it's not always guaranteed. I've seen some horrible planting jobs in quart pots. But even if your plant, when you do get it, if it's up a little high, you can fix that and bring it back to just right. Um, like I said, the, the picture here, this is just a little design that we I put together just to have an idea because a lot of people go, all right, I have all these plants. Where do they go? Who goes where? Um, it's not the fanciest little design, but it's just a quick thing for, like I said, it's a small garden. Like I said, you want to start small. So somewhere between five by seven and four by seven deep. Um, so like I said, this is, this is more of a dry average soil. So this just lays them out. You can spread them out further. Like I said, you can keep them in more. It just depends on how you want to do it. Um, we can go to the next one. I think I'm dwelling on the one there. So we can go to the next slide. Okay. To mulch or not to mulch? That is the question. Um, when you're first starting your garden, I recommend mulching. Only because it's going to keep the weeds down a little bit. And it's, it's just gonna, it'll retain moisture in the soil and it'll just all around, it'll help out. It'll, it'll break down into your soil because like I said, this design that we have here is more for dry average. So as you go along, um, as, this, as the mulch breaks down, it's gonna enrich your soil and it's just gonna make it a better um, environment for everything. Um, Take advantage of fallen leaves as a mulch. I know it. I know it drives my fiance crazy, but I've been, you know, just leaving them around, and it's it's actually working now. Some of them have blown away, but um, it's a great natural mulch. You'll have, you know, it'll have your your insects will be in there. It'll keep. It'll retain the soil. It'll retain um, nutrients. Um, pine needles are also fantastic. If you can do your own compost and mix it in, that's also fantastic. Just remember when you're composting, no meats, no fats. Oh, there's another one. I can't think of it offhand, but just make sure it's um, like vegetable scraps. You can even put like you're, you know, grooming your animals, their hair can go in it. Um, always mix in some leaves for some carbon. Um, like I said, you just like those kitchen scraps, instead of throwing them out, make them work for you. Um, uh, let's see. And a big no-no to the dyed mulches. I know everybody's like, I want my red mulch. I want... Stop. <laughs> um, most of the dyed mulches, they are made from the CCA wood, which is contaminated with the chromium, copper, and arsenic. But I've just been told they're calling them something else now. I think ACQ. So be aware of that. Um, it'll actually harm the soil as it breaks down because it puts all of those... Um, uh, I guess they're minerals into the soil. And that's not what you're looking for. It can also harm the plants. Um, and like I said, it, it can just do completely opposite of what you want it to do. And plus, and like I said, the red mulch drives me crazy because when you see a garden mulch with red mulch, all you see is the red mulch. You don't see the beauty of the plants. Um, I think that's it on that one. Yep, we can go to the next one. Can I... That that last picture with the cardboard and the leaves on that last yeah. slide, I did that. That's that's you did it. Yes, I it's, just did it's it. another fantastic way of getting. Like I said, if you have an area that's like because we're working with an area that's lawn most of the time. So what you want to do, and because like whatever you do, stay away from herbicides if you can. Um, that being said, I, I'm glad you brought that up actually. The, this is a great way to kill off grass without 
I mean, it takes a little longer, but it's also a great way to kill off the grass, which will put itself right back into the nutrients of the soil. And then what you do is you lay down cardboard and then put you know, your compost and your leaves over it and you leave it and let it break down. It's a little longer of a wait time to have your garden going, but if you have the time and the patience, it's a fantastic way to go. I myself am just one of those people that just goes out and digs. <laughs> um, so, so can you plant the first spring if you do this? Usually not, only okay. because nothing is broken down yet. And what happens is the, uh, the cardboard, if it's not broken down the way it's supposed to be, it's not gonna, you're not gonna get the moisture into the roots that's necessary. So you want to, usually you have to wait about two years on those when you do it that way. You can go to the next one, Raj. Okay, so we'll start with just a few plant ideas. These are the ones that were in the design. Um, this is a fantastic little ground cover called Calero and Volucreta, um, also known as Poppy Mallow. It is a great weed smothering ground cover and it's also really good edger in a native garden. Um, it's unfortunately not really native to this area, but it is, the bees love her. And she's just, like I said, she'll, she'll make a nice, a very thick um, weed smothering ground cover. She has a fantastically long bloom time, uh, which is from late spring to the fall. Um, she does get a little ratty looking come the heat of summer, so you can go in, give her a little trim back, and she'll send out all nice, new, pretty uh, foliage and flowers. Um, but she is, like I said, she's a workhorse in the garden, and she's always having that fantastic, also I think she's called wine cups, um, but she's a fantastic little plant. I mean, I, I can't say enough about her, but she needs well-drained soil, which most plants do, um, well, in the dry area. Um, well-drained soil, she'll take dry soil, she'll tolerate moist soil, but she does prefer to be on the drier side. Um, and for those of you who like your container gardens and everything, she makes a great hanging basket or a spiller in a container garden. Um, she is also the host plant for the gray streak, um, gray hair streak butterfly. Um, she makes, like I said, I, I can't stress it enough, she's an important nectar and pollen source for native bees. Um, like I said, she's, she's a little workhorse and I, I think she's one of the greatest plants out there in the native world. Um, you can go to the next one. Asters, my favorites. Okay, I can't say enough about asters. Um, these few right here, these are meant for dry soils um, and full sun. They, um, which is very, it's not unusual, but there's not many of them that tolerate dry soil. Most of them prefer moist soil. So these three here, um, they prefer the dry, like I said. So aromatic aster, which is the one with the little bee on it there. I'm a bumblebee freak. Um, that is um, Aster of Longifolius radon's favorite, which is also known as aromatic aster. It is a cultivar, which we're not gonna get into it at this point unless we wanna do questions later, um, but she's a good cultivar. She's still good for the pollinators. She's not snubbed by them. And come 4th of July with all the asters, um, cut them back by about two thirds by 4th of July. So this way they actually bloom when they're supposed to, which would be, like I said, um, Esther Radon's favorite is the latest bloomer. I had her blooming all the way through to the end of November last year. And it was fantastic since it was still warm. The bees were looking for, you know, plants and there's not many out there at that time. And these few asters are fantastic for it. Um, the Aster Leve, which is smooth aster, um, is also the host plant for the Pearl Crescent, which is down below. So what that means is host plant, I, don't, I didn't mention it before, but a host plant means it's not just a pretty plant, you know, looking good and, you know, um, giving pollen. It's also consumed by the caterpillars. Um, like I said, that's what a host plant is, meaning that the larvae of the Pearl Crescent will actually eat the plant and then, you know, become a butterfly later on. Um, 
But again, like I said, I, I can't stress it enough with the asters, cut them back by 4th of July. Um, the one to the, the last one there is Aster Snow Flurry. She is a great little ground cover aster, which is kind of bizarre to see. She only gets usually about three inches tall and she's covered in all these little tiny white flowers, um, which the bees just go nuts over. Um, she, you don't really have to cut her back, but I usually give her a little, a little, a little snipping just to keep her a little more compact and a little denser for foliage. Um, I'm just trying to think, I think that's all on them. Yes, so like I said, just remember to make sure you cut those back. Liatris, um, another fantastic plant. Oh, by the way, the asters, the um, aromatic aster makes a great cut flower. Um, Liatris. Uh, let's see, where do we start with Liatris? Okay, the fun thing about Liatris is that, I don't know if anybody ever noticed, but they start blooming at the top of the flower and go down from there. Unlike other flowers where they start at the bottom and go up, she starts at the top and goes to the bottom. Um, she's great for pollinators and for, um, for pollen and for nectar, which is a fantastic thing because they need it, you know, they need I always get, I always mix this up, but the pollen is actually to feed their young. And I think the nectar is for them to just have the energy to do all the flying and what they do. Um, so Liatris microcephala, I'm, I'm not always that great with Latin names, um, but small head blazing star is a fantastic plant. Um, they usually range in the 24 to 60 inch range, which I know sounds crazy, but it just depends on the variety. Um, the rough blazing star, which is really neat looking. I just think it looks like, and like aliens, but um, she's a fantastic plant. Um, you can actually cut these once they're done flowering. Sometimes you can get a second flowering out of, out of the Liatris. So again, if you like to have cut flowers, feel free to cut them. Um, they will work that way. The New England Blazing Star, which is a lot of fun too, because she can be, um, she can be lavender, she can be that Liatris pink, or she can be white. So when you have her in the garden, it's always a surprise as to what she's going to be. Um, and then the usual, everybody knows her, the just regular Blazing Star, Liatris Spicata. Don't count her out, she is a workhorse in the garden. The monarchs love her, the bees love her, which they love them all, but I always notice that Liatris spicata gets a lot more, a lot more action from the bees. Um, I think, oh, and leave the seed heads, especially on everything, if you can. Um, on the Liatris, the aster, even on the, um, the poppy mallow, um, the birds will eat the seeds come the winter. And you'll also get little, little volunteers that'll grow. Okay, you can go to the next one. Pycnanthemums. These are the mountain mints. These are the superstars of the pollinator garden. Um, you can't have a pollinator garden without some kind of pycnanthemum mountain mint in it. Um, like I said, they're, they're the super plant of, of pollinators. Um, all 20 of the mountain mints, which I just found this out myself, all 20 of them are native to North America. Um, they are one of another long blooming um, native plant. So they bloom, usually they start about June and go all the way through to August. Um, as you can see from the pictures, I have, I had to cut back on the pictures on these because I probably have pictures of bees that no one's ever seen on some of these things. Um, the one in the corner there, the mountain mint with the Midas fly, that is a fly, it is not a bee, which I had to learn and I thought that was the coolest thing. Um, they do, they like dry soil, these ones, but they will tolerate moist soil. Um, you can treat them just as a regular mint also, unlike um, the European mint, which is invasive by the way. These actually can be used, as you can see, for cocktails or teas and they taste exactly the same. Um, actually, I think they even taste better. Um, the little the one to the side there with the black thread wasted wasp and the carpenter bee, that little bee that's on there was my buddy. 
that's a whole nother story though, but he was my little friend for two weeks. He was missing a wing and um, I took him in and I helped him live his last two weeks. And I cried my eyes out, but I let him live his last two weeks and he was a happy little camper and I learned a lot from him. Um, and by the way, male bees, carpenter bees, you can tell them by, if you look at their faces, there's a little white patch right in the middle of their face and that would be a male. I know whenever a lot of people are going, carpenter bees, ah, those are those horrible bees that chew my wood. Yeah, they are, but they're also fantastic pollinators. Um, like I said, he was my little buddy and he was just, he was a lot of fun. And by the way, the male does not sting, so you can pick him up and, and hold him, which people think I'm crazy, but that's what I do. Um, I, I can't say enough about the mountain mints. Like I said, there's, there's so many more, um, I think I'll have about eight different varieties this year, and that's just the tip of the iceberg, but there's so many for so many different types of soil, um, uh, different types of soils that you can have them everywhere. Like I said, I can't stress it enough that this is a must have in a pollinator garden. Um, do, um, Kim, do they also get leggy and need to be cut back around July 4th? Um, actually, you know, it's funny. They're, hmm, they're one of those tough ones because they bloom so long. What I do with them is I actually let them do their thing. I do give them a little trim and use them. When do I trim? Let me just think. They bloom June to August. I'm trying to think when I actually cut her back. I give her a little pinch in, like I said, when they get about, I guess, like six to eight inches tall, I give them a little pinch just to make them branch out a little more. Um, you don't want to cut her all the way back though because she is a long bloomer and if you do cut her halfway back by 4th of July, it will delay the bloom time, but at the same time you won't have that, um, they won't be there for the pollinators as needed. So what I do with her is once she starts to kind of peter out a little bit, usually in, it's usually like mid-August when everything else really starts to peter out, I give her a little trim selectively, like I cut off all, like you'll see if you can look in the picture where the black thread wasted wasp and the carpenter bee are. If you look into that picture where it's blurry, you see all the buds on it, you can cut her, like this was probably taken in August, I'm thinking. So as you can see the, the flowers that are there, but then you see the buds below, you can cut off the spent flowers and let her keep growing. So then all those buds will keep coming and she'll send up more. So she's, like I said, she's one of those ones where you could technically cut her back, but because she blooms so long, you don't want to. You just want to give her a little pinch. Um, and then, like I said, just a little, a little shearing in August just to rejuvenate her a little from the bottom. Because they, they, um, they grow from rhizomes. Like I said, they're, they grow like the European mint, but they're not invasive like the European mint. Like if, you, if it gets a little out of control, you can just go and pull out you know, pull out the piece that's annoying you and it's not going to take over your garden. Um, but yeah, just give her a little, I guess you'd call her just a little, like I said, a little tidying up come from come August. All right, solid eagle, also known as um, goldenrod. Fantastic plant. This is just the tip of the iceberg of them. Um, I put the ones in here, these can tell, like most, um, most goldenrods can tolerate um, moist soil and everything, but they're more like everybody sees them, you know, they're growing on the roadside and all that, but they are another one of the great plants for late season pollinators. Um, these you can cut back by 4th of July. This way you'll have a more tidy plant and they'll also, you'll have more flowers if you do that also. So the more flowers you have, the more bees you're going to have. Um, seaside goldenrod is a fantastic variety. The nice thing about her is unlike a lot of um, goldenrods, uh, she's a clumper. She doesn't spread by rhizomes. So if you want her, if you don't want one of those goldenrods that's just going to run its way through your yard, she's the one you go for. If you're doing a more formal, <laughs> it sounds, sounds funny, formal native garden. Um, if you want a more formal look where they're not just, you know, intermingling everywhere and just popping up wherever it feels like it, she's the one to go with, like I said, she's a clumper. Um, let's see, so, uh, showy goldenrod. She's just fun because she's she's got a giant, like I said, yeah, as you can see, she's very showy. Um, she's, she's a fantastic plant. 
not one I usually have in my garden. I have actually Saladego, the seaside goldenrod, and I think I have, I think Odora in my yard, um, which is the sweet goldenrod, which her foliage smells fantastic. It's not her flower, it's the foliage. Um, let's see, I'm just trying to think about her. Oh, the, oh, and also a big to-do on these. Um, they are not ragweed. This is not what everybody gets their hay fever from. Um, even though ragweed is native, um, and she's, she's the, um, like I said, she's the reason for hay fever, but if you can tolerate her and you don't get hay fever, ragweed is fantastic to have around. Um, let's see, Saladig on the road, gray goldenrod. There are also some goldenrods that take partial shade, which is another plus. Um, there's, there's so many of them. Um, but the fun thing about these here is if you look with the, the butterfly that's there, that is the um, lined emerald, what is the name? The lined emerald, the wavy lane. Oh my goodness. The wavy lined emerald butterfly. And she's this beautiful little green color, but you see the little weird thing that's on the flower there? That's actually her larvae. What she does, it's a little, it's almost like an inchworm. And what she does is she takes pieces of the plant and puts them on her body so she camouflages herself. If you could just go back to the, uh, the pycnanthemums, the mountain mints, you'll see her on them if you want, yeah. If you see the little brown spots where the Mr. B is there, the uh, carpenter bee, if you see the little brown on the flowers, those are actually the little caterpillars. Um, you can go back, but that's, they're very interesting. I had no idea what they were and I just learned about them this year because I was like, what is all this weird little brown stuff? And then I saw that the little brown things were moving. Um, like I said, they're, they're really neat. I just find it really interesting that they take pieces of the flower and put them on them. And as the flowers do die on them, they will remove them and put new pieces on. Um, so the showy goldenrod is the, I'm sorry, no. Um, speciosa, which yeah, showy goldenrod, is the um, larval host for this fun little caterpillar and this pretty little, I'm not really sure if it's a moth or a butterfly, but the caterpillar is just a lot of fun. Um, we can go to the next one. Achillea melifolium common yarrow. Now, everybody's on the fence of this about it being truly native. Um, there are cultivars in this picture. The white one that you see there is straight species and that's just common yarrow. Um, she could be white to usually, sometimes she'll have a little blush pink in her if you're lucky enough to get one of them. Um, she's a great little ground cover. She will weave her way into spots, but she's a very slow grower. So she's not gonna take over your yard. Uh, I actually have a few customers that are getting her this year in, um, and replacing their lawn with her, um, which I was like, that's gonna be a lot of yarrow, but they're mixing a few other things, but it makes a really nice lush green carpet that nobody knows it's not, not grass. Um, there are cult cultivars, like I said, um, the low one there, the bright red below the white one, that is, I think oh, that's paprika. Um, she's like different shades of red. So she goes from like bright reds and then she fades a little um, the one in the middle there, that's a dwarf variety. Um, it's called strawberry seduction. Um, she only gets about 18 inches tall and there are, I think there's also a yellow version of her. So if you don't want the, they can get a little floppy. Um, the Achilleas, the common yarrows, you can cut them back, but usually let them flower first and then give them a good cut back and then they'll reflower. But the new cultivars, um, they're actually dwarf, so they only stay about 18 inches, so they stay pretty compact. Um, they make a great cut flower, all of these. The one in the top corner there, that pale peachy color, um, that's actually, oh boy, I, oh, terracotta. Okay, I had to remember. I'm like, that is terracotta. So what she does is she has like terracotta color, kind of like that clay pot color, and then she fades to yellows. Um, and then there's moonshine on the bottom, which most people do know. Um, it's up in the air on how millifolium she really is because she's got a little gray in her foliage. 
Um, but they all still, like I said, even though they are cultivars, they still attract many of the bees and, and the butterflies that they still let you want them to do. Um, they usually, like I said, they can get a little, little floppy. So the more sun, the better. They can handle a little shade, but like I said, the more sun, the better. And they range anywhere from 12 to 36 inches. Like I said, they make great cut flower. They also work very well in a container garden. Um, not really much to say about them. They're just fantastic because the butterflies like them. And like I said, and, and the bees like them. Um, and they tolerate a lot of different soils, but definitely well-drained. Okay, you can go to the next one. Everybody's favorite, the purple coneflower. Um, there's so many of them out there now. And unfortunately, a lot of the new cultivars are hybrids and they don't do anything for our pollinators. Um, I'll get to that in another minute. Um, but this one's fun. This is, um, uh, I think the first one that is the, that straight species purpurea um, with a banded longhorn beetle on it, which I just thought was really cool. So that's when I found out that she is also pollinated by beetles. And not all longhorn beetles are the Asian longhorn beetle. That is the horrible thing that's been um, ravaging our, oh, I can't remember what they're actually doing. It's terrible. <laughs> but they're, they're actually really bad, the Asian longhorn. But these, there's about probably 40 plus different types of longhorn beetles that are um, actually beneficial to us. And this is one of them. Um, the cultivar Magnus is a good cultivar because she still gives what she's supposed to, her uh, pollen and nectar for, for the bees and the butterflies. Um, I know there's a lot of double ones out there now, like the Pow Wow series. Um, they do nothing for our pollinators because our pollinators can't figure out how to even get to the pollen on them because of the density of the petals. Um, I'm trying to think the other, and the Cheyenne, the new Cheyenne group, which is, I think they're oranges and reds and whites and yellows all mixed in one. No good for the pollinators. They don't really do much. They have, you'll have a bee here and there, but it's not what like these straight ones are like this one and, and Magnus. Um, they're just, they're workhorses in the garden. You can actually see in the one picture with the beetle, there's uh, the white version of it. Um, I noticed she doesn't get as much love from the bees, but she does, she does bring them in. But she, like I said, she's not a complete waste to have in the garden. And I've also noticed that the white ones don't last as long. They're not as, um, I guess they're, they kind of just last for a couple of years and all of a sudden they'll just disappear. Um, but yeah, the, the purple cone flowers are great for gardens. Um, she makes a good cut flower. Um, great for if you're looking to bring the birds in also. The little, um, the American goldfinch, it's one of their favorites. So if you can handle looking at some older, you know, stems there, you'll bring them in in the fall and they will really thank you for it. Um, I'm trying to think what else. I think the little bees actually use their stems because they're hollow to raise their young. Um, there's, there's so much you can say about, I mean, it's, it's a very overused plant, but at the same time, it really is beneficial if you get the correct ones for your, for your native garden. Okay. Go to the next one. And oxeye daisy. She's a fun one. Um, she can be completely yellow or she can have a little red center or she can have little, uh, a little dark rusty colored center with uh, her petals being different colors, but she usually ranges in this yellow, um, in the yellow range. She, um, I don't have a lot of luck with her for some reason, but then I know other people who are like, I can't kill them, you know, they're just everywhere, but Great for, great for the pollinators. As you can see, there's a little green sweat bee on the one and they're really tiny and fantastic little critters to watch. Um, she'll take moist soil also, but she will tolerate um, drought. So she does work in, in the pollinator garden for a dry average soil. She gets to be, she can get pretty tall. Um, she could be anywhere from 36 to 60 inches. Um, so if you want, you can cut her when she gets to be about, 
I'd say when she gets to be about 12 inches tall, 12 to 18 inches tall, I would say cut her in half. That's what I do. And then she blooms a little later and then she'll, she'll keep going for you because she's, she's got a decent bloom, bloom time. So I think she goes, uh, I think it's July and mine don't stop until September. And that's when they start to peter out, but um, she will seed herself but not overly, you know, she's not an aggressive seeder. She will seed herself though, and they're easy to pull out. Um, let's see, she can, I'm just trying to think uh, what else with her. Was there a specific time you want, you, you'd suggest to cut them back? Uh, um, for her, like I said, she's usually a July, August, well, more of an August bloomer. I don't cut her back completely, like I said, but when she gets to be about 12 inches tall, she's another one where you just want to give her a pinch don't completely cut her, just give her a pinch so she branches out more because the more branching you have, the more flowers you're going to have. So that's that's the bonus of pinching things. Um, yeah, like you can even like this picture here, these were all in a container. So that's why they have that weird, they have a weird stem. They're not usually that bent. Um, they're usually very rigidly straight. And like I said, just give them a pinch. And like I said, then you'll have more flowers. You can deadhead them, which is just taking, um, the spent flowers off them to prolong blooming also, which is like, as you look in the picture here, you can see all the little buds. Same thing with um, with the cone flower, because she always sends up those extra buds. You can always take off that, you know, the spent flower of her, but keep her aside, keep the seeds for the birds and put them somewhere where they can, they can get at them. Um, but yeah, give her a pinch and she'll keep going for you. She's like, so this is another workhorse. She just, she keeps going and and she's just, she's a happy, like I said, just look at her and you just, oh, look at the little daisy. But um, they're usually, I think they're about an inch to two inches. Like I said, it, it just depends. Like I said, she's one of those plants where she can, you know, she has like mutations in her where like she can be, as you see some in the picture, have red centers, some have yellow centers. Um, the ones I had in the yard this year, they were all yellow, but some had, like I said, they had like a rusty, a rusty color in them, but it just, it's just what they do. They're not, um, I said, it's not just a solid, just yellow. They will have variations to them. Um, but because they bring in the little sweat bees and everybody, it's a lot of fun. Um, I'm just trying to see what else we have on her. She's got, yeah. So that's, yeah, that's pretty much on her. Like I said, she will tolerate a moister soil. So if you do have moist soil, she will tolerate it. It's not, she's not gonna be like, oh, it's wet, I can't be here. Um, yeah, she will tolerate a moist soil, but she also, like I said, she tolerates drought, um, which in my yard, they get very tested and I can attest that they do it. Um, but I don't always have luck, like I said, overwintering her. Um, I'm actually, I checked mine today and there's nothing going on there and some things are just starting to come up, but I'll check her again in another two weeks. But she is a fantastic plant um, and a great cut flower. Oh, butterfly weed, everybody's favorite. If you look closely on this picture, you can see there's more, there's actually, in the picture, there's actually, I think there's 13 little carpenter bees in there, which um, I first thought they were little sweat bees, but I was talking to Dan Gilrain of um, uh, Cornell Cooperative out in Riverhead, and he was like, no, those are actually little carpenter bees, which I had no idea even existed. All I knew were just, you know, the big giant ones, the big, they look like big bumblebees. Um, so that was really neat to find that out. I, I, one morning I came out and I was looking at it and I was like, what, what's going on here? And it was, it was covered. There was even more of them there. Um, she is the host plant, one of the host plants for the monarch caterpillar. Um, so that's just one other fantastic reason to have her in your yard. Um, along, like I said, with the pollinators that are there. Um, the birds will eat the seeds if, if they don't blow away as soon as they open, the birds will eat the seeds of them. Um, let's see, what else does she do? She likes, she, she has to have well-drained soil. If the soil is not well-drained, she will, um, she gets to be, I see someone just said, does this plant get large? She gets to be anywhere from about 12 to 24 inches tall but she, she'll spread. So she'll get, she can probably get between 24 and 36 inches wide too at maturity. Um, she will seed herself. 
um, like I said, which most of the um, butterfly weeds and the milkweeds will do. Um, but you can't say enough about her. She's just a workhorse. She, like I said, she's for the monarch caterpillars, um, the monarch butterflies, you see them on them often, but it's more you growing these for the larvae of the monarch caterpillar. Um, and so I can't say enough. She's just, she's fantastic. The other picture is rattlesnake, rattlesnake master. Not native to here, but just so much fun to have in the garden. Um, the, uh, the native wasps love her. And I don't know if you've ever done it, but just one day, if you can, just sit and watch all the wasps in your yard. Now, I'm not talking the European invasive, um, like paper wasps and yellow jackets, but the real, like the great black wasp, which is about three inches, three inches long. And she's very intimidating looking, but she's fantastic. She wants nothing to do with you. And um, that's actually basically, that's what I left out. It's very important. Um, the native bees and wasps that you're bringing in, they want nothing to do with you. All their goal is in life is just to get their babies fed and get them going. So you could actually stand in the middle of the madness of all the native wasps and the bees and they, they could care less that you're here. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've heard it where we're doing, you know, gardens for schools and stuff and like, but we don't want the bees. <laughs> I'm like, it's, you're going to have them, but you're not going to have, like I said, you're not going to have the yellow jackets and the wasps. That's not what you're bringing in with a pollinator garden. With a pollinator garden, you're bringing in the native wasps. And um, like I said, they were in the few pictures back, there was many wasps in there. Those are all native wasps. And they're absolutely amazing to watch. Um, like I said, this, the sand wasp also is one of the thread-waisted wasps. Well, wow, say that fast. Um, she loves the rattlesnake master too. And this year I, I got the pleasure of actually watching her stalk a caterpillar and collect it and do the whole little paralyzing thing they do and bring it to her nest. I was amazed that I even was able to see this. Um, but if you could watch the native bees and the native wasps, you'll, you'll be amazed at the things they do. Um, like, yeah, just like I said, and, and it looks, it looks almost like um, the leaves on it actually look like a yucca, but they're like a really pretty gray blue. And it's just, it's a great plant. Um, I definitely recommend it, especially for dry soil. Okay, I'll go to the next one. And I think we're at the end here. Um, these are just um, what I have here. These are keystone species. Um, this is because, um, I'm just trying to see when, uh, let me get it down. Uh, a keystone species means that others rely on them. Like, because um, take the bumblebee, for example. Um, she is a keystone species because she is able to get the pollen out of tomatoes, cucumbers, and blueberries, um, which I just learned this myself. I did not know this. What they do is with their jaws, they bite the bottom of the flower and then they do this thing. Um, it's called buzz pollination where they shake their wings and that's what brings the pollen out, which I had no idea about this. Um, which I just thought it was the coolest thing. I said it's tomatoes, peppers, and cranberries, and um, I think to yeah, tomatoes. I think tomatoes though that can also that's a whole other story. Let's not get into vegetables. Um, but it's just it's the neatest thing. I just thought that was so cool how like they to get it out they have to do this whole little thing to get it, and it's just it's absolutely amazing. Um, I'm trying to think what else we have here. Um, uh, I'm just trying to think what else I have. So that's that's a zinnia there. Yeah, I know it's not native, but they the bees do love her. So don't be afraid to put in some annuals that you know just for pops of color too. Um, it'll bring more pollinators in. The eastern swallowtails and the black swallowtails love zinnias also. Um, the, and that there, who's that little fella? That one is, I can't remember what her name is. Oh, it's terrible. Um, oh, the one in the corner there with the, um, with the bumblebee with the purple flower, that is New York ironweed. She prefers a moist soil. Um, I'm actually experimenting with her. I have her in part shade and she's doing just fantastic. 
Um, uh, the thread wasted wasp, which is one, is it on this one? On the American Bee? Oh, that's the other one. I'm just trying to think what else I have here. Uh, Kim, yeah. We have we are we are about five minutes away. So I thought, could you do some rapid QA? Um Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, uh, I can uh, ramble on, so I apologize that for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. This was fascinating. But I, I, the quick so, little thing in the far corner there. That's the great black wasp that I was talking about earlier on a uh, swamp milkweed. It's one of the coolest wasps you can ever watch. <laughs> but yes, okay. go ahead. So I, I'm just going to scroll to the top of the chat and uh, pick out questions that I think are of general uh, interest. So just let, just bear with me. I think the first question I have is um, some, uh, I think Kristen uh, asks if uh, you can recommend any native evergreen trees and bushes. Uh, that are that are native. Yes, um, there's not a lot of them, unfortunately. But offhand, um, eastern red cedar, which is the juniper virginiana. Um, I don't want to like bore you with with Latin names. Um, so the eastern red cedar. Um, there's the ilex glabra, which also comes in cultivars, which are just as good. Um, uh, there's Oh, come on, let me get it out of my head. Um, oh, um, Ilex opaca, which is American holly. I think, well, I'm, I'm not very, uh, I think one of the arbovites is native, but I can't remember which one it is. But like I said, the main ones that you would do would be your um, Eastern red cedar. There's white cedar, which is, oh, I can't think of her name offhand, but there's Eastern White Cedar, Eastern Red Cedar. There's the American Holly. There's the Ilex Glabra, which is Inkberry. Um, oh, I'm trying to think offhand. Um, there's things that there's not a lot of evergreen um, natives, which is kind of sad because that's what everybody's looking for. Um, okay, I yeah. will. I will... But I can, if you want to email me, I'll give you a whole list of all the information on. No, no worries. So uh, let me actually um, uh, put your uh, uh, information. Um, so while I read the next question, maybe you can type in your email address into the chat for everybody, uh, just so that they have, if, if we don't end up answering your question or you have to leave or whatever it is, um, we still have a way of getting your question over to uh, Kim. Uh, so Kim, can you just pay? Just take a second to post your email information to the chat. And I'll, in the meantime, ask B's question. Uh, B asks the question, hey, if I have multiple plants that are listed as two feet to four feet, then how do I know what to plant in the front and back? Because, you know, one of them can be taller than the other and so on. Yes, so how do you this is also the joy of native plants when it comes to pollinator gardens. They seem to all fall in between the 24 to 36 inch range. Um, that's, that's a tough one. But what you want to do with them is, um, like I said, you want to keep your lower ones towards the front. But I said, but it's kind of tough when it comes to these because they're usually all about the same height. So that's how you kind of get that meadow feeling out of them also. Um, but, you, but you would want to do like say their solidago that can get to be 60 inches. Um, they only really get to 60 inches if you never come in and cut them back at 4th of July. Um, so you want to keep your taller ones towards the back. So that would be like your solidagos, your liatris, which is the uh, blazing star. They would be more of like your mid ground um, like I said, it's kind of hard when it comes to like pollinator plants because they all seem to be the same height. Um, so you just really want to intermingle them. Um, like I said, unless you have, like I said, the little poppy mallow, she's definitely a ground cover. She's not going to grow any taller. Um, like I said, that's, it's one of those things where, like I said, they're just, they're going to grow together. And like I said, just that whole, the height thing, it's not like you're working with, um, in a shade garden where there's definite, you know, levels of different plants. Like you have your ground cover and your, uh, your mid ground and then your background. Um, like I said, meadows and, and, and wildflowers and, and pollinator gardens, they're more, like I said, they're all that uniform size, which kind of throws everybody off. But 
just let them do their thing, especially in a pollinator garden, because they're just going to go where they want to go. Um, like I said, they're going to seed themselves. So even if you did do it where you had your, you know, your tall solidago in the back, your liatris in the middle, and then you had your, um, like say your common yarrow in the front, um, they're going to seed themselves and just interweave with each other. So when it comes to this, just let them do their thing, honestly. Um, like I said, it's, you're never going to have a formal garden when it comes to pollinator gardens. Um, there are some uh, bee bombs, which are more of like a mid-ground or a background, um, but even them, they're, they're controllable size-wise. It's very important, actually, to get that to get that cut back come, you know, that 4th of July cut back because it's going to branch out your plants and they're actually going to bloom when they're supposed to, not ahead of time. Um, but yeah, that's like I said, it, it's just weird because they all wind up being the same size right, <laughs> when right. it comes to pollinator right. gardens. So that's just one of those things like you just have to like the fact that they're all just going to intermingle. And that's what makes it look so pretty too because right. they, they are all there and like you can see them all at once and it's like I said they all wind up being 24 to 36 inches unless like I said you get in um I mean we can go further into like the gray-headed coneflower which can normally get to 60 inches so that you would keep towards the back um like I said you want to you want to keep in mind their mature size not what they are when you get them you want to look in to see what their mature size is and to see if you can control that um, like I said, with the pinching and the cutting back and the tidying up, um, like I said, there's, yeah, the pollinator garden's kind of rough that way, like I said, because they're all like the same height. And, and, and Adrian asks if you can put, if you, if, if you were to put some bushes in the back that would attract, uh, produce berries for uh, birds. Uh, what are some good berry? Oh, absolutely. Bushes? Now we're talking. Um, you can do arrowwood, which produces dark uh like like a blueberry we don't eat them but like a blue blue berry two separate words um that the songbirds will fight over and they don't last on the tree longer than well the shrub they don't last on the shrub longer than like five minutes once they're ripe um you can do high bush blueberry um which is such a spectacular plant um just year round they're gorgeous um they would work you could do, there's a lot of viburnums. You could actually do American cranberry bush. You could do um, the amelanchiers, which are the service berries. Um, aronia, which are the choke berries. Uh, oh, offhand, there's so many of them. Um, I know there's itia that doesn't get a berry, but it brings in hummingbirds. Um, did you mention oh, the winterberry? <laughs> I'm sorry? Oh. oh, did you mention the winterberry? <laughs> winterberry, you know, it's funny. Winterberry is one of the last berries they eat, um, but winterberry is one of them. Um, even if you go to the straight species inkberry, she can get to be eight feet tall and she'll have berries, but she's another one where um, she's the last resort. They'll eat them last. Um, oh, there's so many. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Uh, like I said, a lot of the viburnums. There's also um, maple leaf viburnum gets berries. Um, oh, I'm trying to think. There's so many. Uh, I have Quick a question on the berry bushes. Do they have to have full sun or can they just do late afternoon sun? Uh, late afternoon sun is actually fantastic because that is the strongest sun. Um, okay, because I have two spots that I get all late afternoon sun. Okay, thanks for the berry. Yeah, bushes. you just want to, like, usually when it comes to that, though, you want to keep the soil more on the moist side because they get that strong. It doesn't have to be wet. Um, but you just want to make sure the soil's moist enough to ha handle whatever varieties you're putting there when it comes to uh, burying ones. Because usually they like, like I said, most of the buried plants like a moist soil, but as they mature, they will adapt to a drier soil. Okay, so, so no, thanks everybody for hanging in there with us for 10 minutes over. I know it's, it's kind of like a big investment of time. Uh, it, it, you know, by popular demand, we are going to bring Kimberly back <laughs> to talk. I'm sorry, I ramble on. <laughs> yeah, I'm like a right. ramble rambler. <laughs> I'm going to rein it in <laughs> next time. <laughs> obviously, obviously, we can't get enough of you. But uh, so, so we'll definitely do another session with uh, Kimberly. Uh, but I just want to put this up. Uh, tomorrow we have a meeting for the Rewild at Dodge. Um, so we'll talk about some of the sustainable uh, landscaping initiatives going on there and just 
we're going to be creating uh, uh, sort of Saturday mornings at the Dodge. So we have some kind of a community going where people can coming out of the pandemic, meet each other, see each other, say hi, whatever, um, touch and feel each other to see if they are real. <laughs> and then now uh, we have the <laughs> other thing is the artist. <laughs> I, I, I wonder because I only see people as, uh, you know, it, it could very easily be living in a simulation here. Um, so, and then there's the Artemis at Rewild meeting Tuesday, March 30th at 7.30 p.m. And of course, Anthony Marinello on April 6th I, uh, at 7.30 p.m. talking about planting a pocket prairie for any size yard. Our plant sale goes on till April 10th, though, of course, uh, the earlier you buy the, you know, whatever, we'll be, we are actually placing an interim order to hold plants. So, you know, sometimes they tend to go, I'm not going to pressure anybody. Uh, that's not the point, but definitely if you, the earlier you place it, the earlier, you know, I tell the wholesalers and, and they hold stock. So um, go ahead and do that. Uh, so that's, that's it. Thank you so much for, for being with us and definitely feel free to drop a note to us at minuteryylongisland.org or to uh, Kimberly KMS Natives. Uh, she put yes, her email down. And I answer them all. <laughs> I answer all of them. I usually have a plant list for you just for fun. <laughs> yeah, so depending on your situations absolutely and and and, and um, if you live near there kms natives is one of the pickup points for the uh rewild native plant sale and of course while you're there you're welcome to pick uh, uh pick be, many other beautiful things but i should be fully stocked i think come mid april but i'll put an i'll put an announcement out thanks everybody have yourself a wonderful night and kimberly thank you thank you thank you it was thank awesome. you <laughs> Bye, everybody. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks. <laughs>